Welcome everyone, my name's Alice. I've met some of you, not all of you. I'm relatively new to working with um, BSDs of any kind, especially uh, FreeBSD, which is the one I'm most, mostly working with at the moment. Um, so I've come here to, to talk to you a little bit about um, a project called Chaos, which is another open source project, um, and how it helps open source communities to better understand uh, the health and sustainability of their communities and of their projects through using metrics to better understand um, the projects. So before I get started, or let's get started, um, put your hand up if you contribute to an open source project. Keep your hand up if you contribute to two open source projects. Five. Ten. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Ed's got his hand up still. Um, put your hand up if your one of your projects consumes another open source project. What if it keep your hand up if it consumes more than ten other open source projects? More than a hundred? More than a thousand? I'm, I'm counting all the way down, you know? All right, so this is, um, this is a talk that hopefully should be of interest to you as, as users and contributors to open source projects. Let me see if I can just get this turned a little bit. Okay, so the foc focus of this presentation is on using metrics to improve project health and sustainability. Open source projects aren't static, they aren't healthy or not healthy, sustainable or not sustainable. One of the advantages of using open source is that we can work with these projects to improve health and sustainability, whether you're a practitioner, can't read this, researcher or something in between. So that's what I will focus on in this presentation. So I just wanted to start quickly by thanking some of the um, sponsors of the Chaos Project, which includes the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Linux Foundation, and the Ford Foundation. So I'll say a little bit about myself. Um, my name's Alice Sowerby. I don't think it actually says that there. It said it on the first slide. Uh, I'm from the UK. Oh, sorry, that's the microphone. Um, I'm British. I'm a freelancer. You can see some pictures of me up there. One, I'm wearing a lot of sparkling. I haven't done Strictly. This is my plan, first step of my plan to get famous enough to do Strictly. Um, then that picture at the bottom there is me in Chequers, which is the UK Prime Minister's country house. If you want to know why I was there, I've been there twice, then you can come and ask me about that later. It's a little story. Um, so in June, I started providing program management work uh, for the FreeBSD Foundation, and I work part-time. I've been working in the B2B tech sector for over 15 years. Um, the places I've worked at range from developer tooling startups, so I kind of got in on the ground floor with containers, um, also um, machine learning tooling startups, and I also most recent, recently was doing DevRel for Equinix uh, on their Equinix metal or free bare metal offering. Um, outside of the FreeBSD Foundation, I'm active in several open source projects, including, oh, hey, that's not what I meant to do. Okay, excuse me. There we go. Hey, got it. Including Chaos, which is the one that I'm talking about today, and also with the To Do Group, which um, is a community of practice for OSPOs, open source program officers. Um, Location wise, I'm based near Bath in the UK. So I'll start with a very quick overview of the Chaos Project, and then I'll tell you a little bit about some of the practitioner guides, which are a great place to start when you want to understand about um, Chaos and using metrics for understanding open source project health. So Chaos stands for Community Health Analytics for Open Source Software. It's focused on developing metrics and developing software to help people improve the health and sustainability of their open source projects. 
So you can see here, we are an open source Linux Foundation project. Um, we are globally distributed with 2,000 plus, uh, probably higher by now, uh, members in Slack. So it's super busy and I, there's loads of stuff going on that I don't get a sight of. I'm a bit peripheral if I'm completely honest. Um, and I will say it's a really, really friendly and welcoming and easy to get started with open source project. And it's one of the first ones that I've been actively contributing to. So I'm, I'm very happy to be there with them. Um, what they don't do or what we don't do is, is medical health. I mean, community health sounds like medical, but it's not. Um, and it's, an, it's not for profit. And there's lots of ways that people contribute um, that's not code-based because it's primarily about um, education, analytics, um, sharing best practice and things like that. Um, there are some links in the slide deck. Um, I'll make sure that the deck gets made available if you want to take a look at those links. Um, and if there is any information that, that's on there that you would like to see in more detail. Also, the speaker notes. <laughs> Um, just to say, this slide deck came from one of the other um, maintainers on the project called Dawn Foster, Dr. Dawn Foster, who some of you, I think, know. Um, so she's provided me with the, the deck, and these are her notes that I'm cribbing slightly from, because she's much more experienced with the project than I am. I've only been here a few weeks, a few months, I should say. Um, so contributions, if anyone is curious about coming to see the work we do, and doing some doing something with us uh, obviously code although I did say it wasn't just code metrics and metric model development so what are interesting metrics to use when you're looking at open source project health uh, community management so the community is extremely friendly and sociable and there's a huge amount of focus put on um, making sure that people have a really good experience coming as, as newbies and that I look at this project as being a really gold standard for how uh, to welcome new people into an open source project. Um, and you can see like anything that you might wanna do with any kind of work in the world, that's something that we need. So project management, design, website. I, I was working on the booth at uh, Open Source Summit in Seattle which was how I ended up meeting Greg Wallace, which is how I ended up working here. It wasn't that long ago, but here I am. Um, I'm just gonna skip through this a little quickly because I know we're, we may be tight on time. But what I'll mention is that the groups that we have in the project, um, we have an OSPO group, so for, for folks who are interested in um, understanding how open source is managed within organizations, governments, um, industry, that kind of thing. There's an OSPO group, there's an acad academic group, so folks who are interested in, in the research of understanding how open source projects are managed and, and made sustainable. Um, there's a data science group, then we've got um, geographical chapters. Uh, Chaos Africa is particularly um, vibrant, very, very busy. Uh, and then we've got some other programs where people can get more involved with um, uh, proactive support like DEI, badging for events and projects. Um, there are two pieces of software. One, they're essentially around collecting and uh, collecting, analyzing and presenting the metrics that you can gather about open source projects. Augur is the one that works mainly with GitHub and Grimoire Lab is, um, can take data from multiple different sources. It's like, um, queryable dashboard and, and, and so on. Okay, I will not talk too much on this one because I think everyone's seen the XKCD. There's a thing at the bottom and um, even on the Sovereign Tech Fund website, they've got a little picture of this sort of version of this. Um, but we all know that if open source projects uh, if you don't understand them, then you can't necessarily predict whether they are uh, sustainable or, or pose a risk to your organization or indeed to your project if you're consuming another project. You can see here, um, I don't know how big this is for you. 
but we basically have, um, we basically look at metrics as being used primarily for, for two purposes. Um, so historically, chaos has been a bit more focused on contribution metrics. And so this is for projects that you're participating in. So most pr practitioners working in OSPOs would tend to think of those as outbound or upstream contributions. We have a starter project health metrics model with a collection of four simple metrics to help people get started measuring contribution. And these starter metrics can be used by research, researchers or practitioners. Uh, we've also been focusing on consumption metrics, which is the second type. These metrics are mostly related to inbound or downstream consumption of the open source software that you use in your project, sorry, product, services, and infrastructure or research groups. So when we think about um, metrics, even just on GitHub to see what it gives you, there are lots and lots of different metrics. And once you start to look around at data sources, you can end up feeling very overwhelmed by the metrics that you have associated with your project or with other projects, which is even worse because you don't always have the context of that project. Um, so the way that we like to look at it is, is this gold question for metrics uh, model. So you don't start with the metrics. The metrics is the last thing because they serve your goals. So you start off by thinking, what am I trying to achieve here in relation to this project? What questions do I need to answer to be able to answer those, uh, sorry, achieve those goals? And then what metrics might be able to help me better understand what's going on with this project? So metrics themselves require interpretation. Um, the Chaos Project spent quite a lot of time gathering up all the different types of metrics that could be used to understand open source projects better. Um, then they realized that people were struggling to interact with those and know which ones to pick, know how to put them together to answer questions and build a picture. So uh, what Dawn has, it's mainly Dawn, but with a few other people helping, what she's done is she's created these practitioner guides. Um, at the moment there are four. So there's an introduction one which covers the um, overall concepts around metrics and, and how you use them. And then we've got three specifically on responsiveness, contributor sustainability, and organizational participation. And I know that one of the next ones that she's looking at is security. Um, and if you want to see where they are, there's a link just here at the bottom. Um, just to note that in the guides, they contain lots of links as well to research. So let's talk about how we actually get started. With, um, with the metrics guides, or the practitioner guides, um, you essentially have to start off with an idea about um, strategy. So by thinking strategically about your overall goals, you're in a better place to determine whether a project is achieving the goals. Open source projects create a tsunami of data that can be overwhelming but by focusing on your goals, you can develop a metric strategy that helps you focus on the metrics that matter to you most. So metrics, sometimes people have bad experience with metrics because they feel as though metrics are going to be used against them and um, are not necessarily used in context. So one of the main things that we say about metrics is that it's only really useful if you know the context in which they're being um, understood. So if you want to understand your open source project and its metrics, then you really need to make sure that you're collaborating with the community uh, to understand what's actually happening under the hood. So one, one example would be if you're seeing fluctuations in some of your metrics, then it might be related to an event, for example, for example, if uh, a hackathon happened or a conference happened, you might see contributions going up or you might see contributions going down. Um, if you know the cause for that, then you can understand the metrics in context. So let's talk about uh, the responsiveness guide. Um, 
So seeing large numbers of neglected issues and change requests on a project is a red flag because it can indicate that they either don't have enough contributors to handle the incoming contributions or they don't actually care or want contributions from others, which is something that you sometimes see in company-owned projects or in the scientific space where researchers sometimes open source projects that they only plan to use for their own needs. It's important for projects to respond to change requests in a timely manner because a quick response can help you to retain contributors who otherwise might become discouraged if they don't receive a timely response. Timely, thoughtful and kind responses to contributors indicate that you appreciate their work. Being responsive to the contributions of other people helps grow the community and improve contributors' sustainability. While quick responses are important, it's also important to keep up with change requests and resolve them in a timely manner, even if the response is closing requests that will not be merged. It's easy to get behind on incoming contributions, and we all get behind sometimes, but not addressing these contributions promptly creates technical debt and reduces the chances that they will ever be merged, because older change requests are likely to have so many merge conflicts that they become too difficult to accept. In both of these responsiveness metrics, it's important to focus on the trends. If responsiveness is already improving, keep up the good work. However, if you see responsiveness declining, then it might be time to find ways to improve it, including recruiting more contributors and maintainers for your project. The Responsiveness Practitioner Guide has a bunch of details about ways to improve responsiveness for the projects you care about. So that was the first guide on responsiveness. The second guide, we talk about contributor sustainability. Now there are some key, key metrics here. Contributor absence factor, which used to be known as the bus factor, but we tried to make it less um, literal in the way it's described. Contributors and type of contributions, and you'll see how these are uh, shown in the next couple of slides. So contributor sustainability is an important part of assessing whether an open source project and community has enough contributors for the project to be sustained over the long term. So contributor sustainability has a large impact on overall project sustainability. There are lots of projects with a single maintainer. Many projects struggle to find enough people to actively participate in their projects and continue to maintain them over the long term. The reality is that there are a lot of open source projects and not enough con contributors. So maintainers are in desperate need for help across the various types of contributions needed to have a successful and sustainable open project. If there are not enough contributors to sustain a project, this increases the risk that the project will fail, which creates a variety of often significant challenges from the users, for the users, and other projects that depend on it. We recommend measuring contributors' sustainability because there are a couple of things it can tell you. First of all, how big of an issue is your current contributor situation? If it's like this one, you should really focus on getting a few more people who can contribute and eventually be moved into leadership roles like maintainers. You might also find that there are people who are contributing more than you realize, which is the other reason that this is a good metric. This can help you think about who you can encourage to contribute more, or maybe find someone who could move into a leadership role. Reaching out to someone and acknowledging their work while encouraging them to do more can help quite a bit with growing your contributor base. Sometimes people just need a bit of encouragement, and you can ask them for specific things that you know they're good at. There are several communities that I've gotten more involved with because someone asked for my specific help. And chaos is one of those. The catch here and with many metrics is that we don't want to just think about people who are making commits. This is a good start, but you should also be thinking about how you can move more people into leadership positions to be responsible for things that might not show up in your existing data, like documentation, community management, marketing, and other important roles. The practitioner guide linked on this slide has even more suggestions about how to improve contributor sustainability for open source projects. How are we doing for time? Are we okay? All right. Um, so, orga organizational participation. 
So for this one, we're really talking about how are, how are organizations engaging with an open source project. So we don't always spend enough time thinking about how organizational participation impacts the sustainability of open source projects. So you should also look for organizational diversity as part of the health and risk for open source projects. And I know that Ed was showing a graph that was a bit similar to this, uh, this concept. If all or most of the contributions are for, from people at a single company, what happens when that company has a shift in strategy or gets acquired or runs out of money and goes out of business? Would the project be able to continue if the company pulled all of its employees out of the project? These single vendor open source projects might not seem risky, but they can quickly become unviable after a licensing change or when everyone stops working on the project. The biggest challenge with identifying trends for organizations in open source projects is that the org organizational affiliation data is almost never accurate enough to use without doing some manual cleanup. This example is relatively clean compared to some others, but you can still see that about 20% of the contributors aren't matched to organization. And I'm not sure how, our, how the CBSD data compares to this one. I know we had a little white section on that um, pie chart. So I guess that's unsponsored work, but do we know who contributed it? Um, if most of the work being done by people at a single organization, the project might be riskier to use and harder con to contribute to than a project with contributions that are spread out over many organizations. If you work for a dominant organization, you might want to focus on getting contributors from some others by reaching out to people who you know are interested in the project. And again, there's more in the guide. Um, so we don't have a guide yet on security, but I will say a little bit about it. Um, it's, it's a contributor to project sustainability. Um, so really we're, what we're talking about here is, are we seeing patches coming out regularly? Um, are we seeing vulnerabilities being fixed? And I don't know if you're familiar with this idea of a lib year. Anyone heard of a lib year? Okay, so it's basically <laughs> um, the age of all your dependencies added together, if that makes sense. So uh, here's a definition. In fact, I think, yeah, there's a link there, which when you get the slide deck, you can click on. If your system has a one-year-old dependency and a three-year-old dependency, then your whole system is four lib years old. And it's a way of comparing different open source projects to say, you know, is this one feeling like it's sort of healthy and looked after, or is it not so much? Okay. Um, so here we're looking at the frequency of releases, even the tiny point, point releases. So it's critical that security updates and bug fixes land in a release in a timely manner, and it's important to get the new features out too. Um, it's not necessarily that they're happening uh, in a, in a very quick cadence, but that it's regular. Um, so the release frequency for a project is influenced by the size of the project and how many dependencies it has on other projects and so on. You should think about whether a project is cutting releases frequently enough to help keep the project up to date and secure. So here are some, some, just some extra thoughts that relate to sustainability for a project. Um, so we tend to think of projects, sustainability in the corporate world as being something related to viability of a project. So we think, is the project likely to be viable over the longer term? Um, so Gary White from Verizon developed four metrics models, each on one of the focus topics on, listed on this slide along with a fifth starter viability model, the smaller set, subset of metrics. It, the notes don't match the slide on this one. <laughs> but um, we're talking about essentially, what can we find out about the governance of a project? What do we know about the community of a project? 
Um, and do we know anything about the strategy of a project which can help us to make a decision about whether it's a project we should use? Um, so just to finish up there, we have, these are quite hard to read. We have a few links here which you'll be able to access when you get the slide deck. Um, if you're interested in, in coming along to see how the Chaos Project works, it's very easy to get involved. You just come along to that link at the top and you have a look. Um, if you want to listen to my voice some more, um, I'm host, I host some of the podcasts and I produce most of them. Um, and all the podcasts about guides are ones that I've hosted um, fairly recently. Uh, but there's a, a public community calendar if anyone wants to come and have a look. So final thoughts. These and adopting open source can lead people to use software without considering its long-term viability and sustainability. Not all open source projects are created equal and some will be more viable than others over the long term. The success or failure of the open source projects you use can have a real business or, or research implications. When a project you rely on later becomes unviable, it can have negative implications for your users, customers, reputation and research. One of the best ways to mitigate the risks associated with consuming open source is by contributing to the projects you use, so it can help to think of contribution and consumption together, especially for the projects that are most strategic to you. The Chaos Practitioner Guide series is designed to help you think about how you can improve those open source projects that you care about the most from within as you contribute. Thank you. Um, time for questions or not? I'm, I'm also around if anyone has questions, so um, we, we need to get the next person on. Yeah, okay. Is there, are there any questions? <laughs> Okay, cool. Makes it easy. Thank you. <laughs>